In this video, we're going to go over the Bendix PS5 pressure carburetor. You may have watched the video on the PR58 carburetor, which is a very, very large carburetor. The PS5 is much smaller and something that you would find perhaps on a fuel injected Bonanza aircraft. So this would be on something maybe with an 0470 or similar sized engine on it. The great advantage of pressure carburetors is that the fuel is under pressure from the fuel tank all the way into and including the carburetor, so there is less chance of fuel uh, vapor lock. Um, there is also less chance for ice in these carburetors, the way that the discharge nozzle is separated from the Venturi. And lastly, this carburetor will work in pretty much any attitude without without really a care in the world. So it will run upside down or right side up. It doesn't know the difference. So with any carburetor, the basic function of the carburetor is to measure or determine the amount of air going into the engine and supply the correct amount of fuel for that volume of air going through the carburetor. So let's go through this drawing and see how the PS5 operates. All right, so starting right here, this is an, an updraft carburetor. So we'll start right here. This is an updraft carburetor, so the air is gonna come up through it this way and on into the engine. So getting familiar with some of the things here, we do have a Venturi built in right here. Remember, this is a cutaway, so the Venturi is actually round, and so it represents on both sides. We have a Venturi. And with the Venturi, what happens is as air goes through the Venturi, the air is forced to accelerate to make through this restriction. And when air accelerates, it has a pressure drop. That's Bernoulli's principle right there. So within this area right here, we have a low pressure area or a suction is created. So right there, we know that we have some sort of suction. And down here, we have an air impact tube there's several of them. And what that is sensing is the air that is coming up through the carburetor also will impact that little tube and create pressure in this area right here. So in the gray area, we have a suction. There's suction there and there's suction there. And in the bluer area, we have pressure. So anywhere we see that, we have impact air pressure. So taking those two forces, let's take a look at where they're going. So let's start with the uh, impact air. So the impact air we can see comes up through here into this chamber and into A. So chamber A is impact air air or a pressure. And let's talk about what that pressure does now. So right here, we have a diaphragm. And over here, we have a diaphragm. And a diaphragm is a rubber that is attached to this shaft right here. So that rubber is actually attached and affixed to that shaft. So when any one of these diaphragms, either this diaphragm or this diaphragm right there, move this little poppet valve right in here is also going to move. Now, one of the confusing things about this drawing is it does appear that this is the poppet valve right there and it appears that this is the seat right there. That is not the case whatsoever. The poppet valve is actually located right there. And so if this shaft right here moves to the right, it is going to open. And if it moves to the left, actually, you know what? We should write this over here in pen. So if the shaft moves to the right, it is going to open. And if it moves to the left, it is going to close. It's going to close. So we can get rid of that right there. Back to my pen. And all right, let's, so let's make sure we're all in agreement here. So this right here is my valve that is going to open or close. To the right is open, to the left is closed, and that is going to allow fuel to come in through and enter that way. So that's where we're going to head with that. So right now we're talking about the pressure in chamber A. So impact air is going to be a pressure. It is going to be a pressure inside of A, which will tend to force this diaphragm and pop it to the right. In fact, we should write this permanent so we can see it real well. So pressure is always going to move that diaphragm to the right. 
Now we have suction. So we have Venturi suction right there and right there. It's going to work its way around through into chamber B. So chamber B is going to have suction or a vacuum. And that vacuum is going to assist A and pull that diaphragm that way. So we have A and we have B. And the more A we have and the more B we have, the more the poppet is going to move to the right, which is open. And this pressure that we have at A and B, we call that the air metering force. So A, the pressure in A, plus the vacuum in B will equal our air metering force, AMF, air metering force. So that's A plus B. So the more pressure we get in A or the more suction we get in B, then the more air metering force we get. And if we think this through just a little bit, well, with this throttle valve closed right here, we don't get a lot of air metering force, but we'll just say we have uh, enough to operate. So we have a suction created here at the Venturi, and we have pressure coming in through here, through the impact air, and that is gonna equal our air metering force. And then if we open the throttle valve more, what is going to happen is we are going to increase the amount of air that is flowing into the engine, which will increase the amount of impact air, which will increase the pressure in A. Meanwhile, we're going to have more air going through the Venturi, which is going to create more of a vacuum in the Venturi. So we will have more vacuum in B, so our air metering force will go up. So air metering force is a measurement of the air going into the engine. All right, now we can talk about some fuel. So fuel, fuel inlet is right there. So fuel is going to enter into this chamber right there. We'll call that chamber E. We'll write this over here so we can remember that chamber E. It's not labeled, but now it is. All right, so chamber E. So fuel comes into chamber E. It's going to go past a fuel strainer and off into this chamber. Now, right here, we just have a fuel pressure connection so we can measure that in the cockpit. And fuel will come up through here. And if we get any bubbles, we need something to indicate bubbles with bubbles of air. We don't want bubbles of air going into our carburetor. So we have a vapor vent right here. And that vapor vent is nothing more than you can see there's just a little tiny passageway right there, a restriction. That is just a return back to the fuel tank. So any vapors that get collected up here in the top of this tube are just going to work their way out and off to the fuel tank where they will mix back with the fuel and the bubbles will then rise to the top and then the fuel pump will pump in more fuel that should be uh, void of any bubbles. But any bubbles that do get in there, they just come here and they go back to the tank. So that's just always open and, and flowing that way. All right, so we have fuel is entering E. Fuel is entering E. And we talked about the fact that there's a poppet right there. So whenever we have more air metering force, we are going to open that poppet even more, and that allows fuel to enter into chamber D. So chamber E, echo, that is our inlet fuel at about 9 to 14 PSI. But the fuel does have to go past a restriction right there, our poppet valve. So the pressure in D will now be less anytime it has to go through that poppet valve. And that is our unmetered fuel. So we have our fuel inlet, then unmetered. And it's called unmetered in D because it has yet to be metered. We have not passed our way through any sort of metering orifices at all. All right, so then fuel is in D, and then it is gonna go up through our main metering jet. So that is now the thing that is going to meter our fuel, the item that meters our fuel. So fuel is gonna go into chamber C, which is now considered our metered fuel pressure. Now, if you watch the video on the PR58, there was chambers A, B, C, and D all working together on the poppet. And you'll notice this one is very different in that C, chamber C, has no effect 
on the poppet. There is no connection anywhere in C that actually has a force on any of these two diaphragms. So if C has no effect on the diaphragm, then C is in fact not part of the fuel metering force. So if we had to say, well, what is fuel metering force? Then it's just D equals fuel metering force, fuel metering force. Now I will point out that because B, chamber B is on both sides of a diaphragm, Therefore, we have a vacuum in B. So does B have any effect on the diaphragm here between B and D? Well, none of the documents that I could locate talk about that, but I do have to believe that B, if it's a suction, is going to go this way. It's going to pull in on that diaphragm, which does assist D. So I suppose if we wanted to, we could say that uh, D plus the vacuum in B would equal fuel metering force. However, I could not find any documentation to back me up on that, but you can see that it is a flexible diaphragm. And so that would make sense that the suction in B does play some sort of effect on moving that poppet valve one way or the other. All right, now the thing about all of these chambers, A, B, and D, is they have to be in equilibrium. And by that, what I mean is that if A, A and B are stronger than D, then it will constantly push the poppet that way until this valve was 100% open. Or if D was greater than A and B, then it would move the poppet this way until it was fully closed. Well, we don't want the poppet either all the way open or all the way closed. We need the poppet to be in equilibrium at all times. So what that means is as the pressure in A and B go up and the poppet valve moves to the right, then that means it will open the poppet up a little more and as that poppet opens a little bit more, the pressure in D is going to be closer to the pressure in E right here. So A and B open up the poppet that will increase the pressure in D and it will increase the pressure in D until such time it equals the pressure in A and B and then it is in equilibrium. Well, if we were to close the throttle some, then that would mean that A and B decrease. Well, if A and B decrease, that means it's going to move the poppet this way to the left towards close. That means it will reduce the pressure in D until D is equal to A and B. So under normal operation, what we wanna see is that the pressure in A plus B is equal to the pressure in, well, we'll use our, our B, plus D. So both of these should be in equilibrium. And anytime they're not in equilibrium, something is going to change. All right. Just like I said, if A plus B go up in pressure, then the poppet valve must open. Poppet valve opens until B plus D equals A plus B. All right, and the opposite is true. If A plus B goes down, then the poppet has to close until the pressure in D and B go down to equal what just happened there. So it's always got to be in equilibrium. Hopefully that made sense to you, as it was supposed to. So we want this to be in equilibrium, and it is the pressures in A and B that dictate what happens to the poppet and the poppet will open or close until such time as D equals A and B. And that will dictate the pressure in D, which dictates the pressure in C. So the more pressure we have in D, obviously the more pressure we're gonna get across this uh, main metering jet, resulting in more pressure in C. So if we started off with, let's say, 10 PSI coming into E, and we had a poppet open at a certain amount and we ended up with, and I'm just making up some numbers, we had 10 there. So let's say now we have uh, eight PSI here, but it goes across this orifice right there. So we end up with seven there. Well, 
if this is always going to be 10, let's say it opened up even more. Well, this is 9. Now this would be 8. So it's going to be proportional across this main metering jet right there. So that is how this section operates right here under normal operating conditions. But we have a problem. And that problem is when the throttle valve is closed, for idle, there is very little airflow across the venturi, which means very little suction. And there is very little impact air, which means very little pressure. So A plus B, our air metering force, is far too low to actually move the poppet valve to get the proper amount of fuel. So to handle that, what this carburetor has is a spring inside of chamber A. And that spring is designed to hold the poppet open right there just enough to get some idle fuel through into chamber D, off into C, and off to the carburetor. But the problem is, it's not metering anything. It's just a set value. And with idle, you could have a low idle. You could have a medium idle or a fast idle. So there's multiple speeds in there where this carburetor might be asked to operate. You know, the pilot may want a very low idle at 550 RPM and then add just a little bit of throttle to taxi and pull it back. And so the pilot is continuously moving this throttle lever back and forth. But this part of the carburetor right here is stupid to the whole thing. It has no brains because it's just a fixed orifice here and a fixed orifice there, and that is not going to work real well. So as the pilot adds a little bit more air, the carburetor is going to tend to go lean. As, as the pilot pulls back, it's going to tend to go rich. So we're going to be looking for a fix, something to, to compensate for this down the line. But while we're in this section right here, uh, it would makes sense to talk about the uh, manual mixture control, the manual mixture control needle valve and the idle cutoff plunger. So as with any carburetor, you have to be able to adjust the mixture. If the pilot wants it to run rich or wants it to run lean, uh, obviously because in an aircraft or going up in altitude, you want to lean out the mixture, you want it to run rich when it's at higher power settings and when you get into cruise, you want to lean the carburetor out for best economy. So this incorporates a couple of little things right here that are going to accomplish that. So when the pilot pulls back on the mixture, what the pilot is in effect doing, they're moving this needle right here. That needle right there is going to go backwards. It's going to go that way as the pilot leans it out. And what we have here then is a calibrated leak or a bleed. So you can see that as impact air comes up through here, it's going to go through here, around through here, and up into here as a bleed if I want it to. Now, we could have this completely closed off. So if it's closed off, then there is no connection between between A and no connection between B because the impact air would come through here. It's always going that way. And it would get to here and it's blocked off. So nothing happens. And Venturi is coming up through this way, through this way, up here. Can't go this way. Nothing happens. So that would be the full rich position where nothing is happening. But as the pilot pulls back on this arm right here, we open up a little bit of a bleed there. And so what that means is that as Venturi suction is coming up into here and is trying to create a vacuum inside of B, some of that air is going to go down this way in the vacuum and be pulled out this way. So you're robbing some of the vacuum out of B and shoving it this way, which is then um, into a pressure. So, because it's going to go from low pressure to high pressure. So, in effect, what that's going to do, it's going to lower the pressure in B. And because we have a vacuum pulling some of the air, actually, the air would want to go, I'm going to use a colored pen here. The air would want to go this way because it's a vacuum. And so it would go out and around that way. So, you are stealing some of the vacuum out of uh, chamber, sorry, you're stealing some of the vacuum from B 
and you're stealing some of the pressure from A, which is going to decrease the air metering force in A and B. And of course, if we decrease the air metering force, what's going to happen? The poppet is going to close a little bit. And if the poppet closes a little bit, then the pressure in D is going to go down, which is going to make the pressure in C go down, which means there's less fuel going off to the rest of the carburetor and less fuel to the engine. So let me erase this right down here because it looks messy. So anytime we pull back on this arm, we create a bleed right here, which lowers the air metering force, which decreases the fuel going to the carburetor. Now, at some point, the pilot may want to cut off all of the fuel and shut down the engine. And with most carburetors and fuel injection systems in light aviation with piston uh, aircraft, to shut off the aircraft, we pull back on the mixture until we cut off all of the fuel rather than turning off the key. By pulling back the mixture all the way and cutting off the fuel, it's a safer engine uh, in case somebody were to move the propeller and then we would have a magneto that was hot. We could definitely damage uh, somebody and that's a very bad thing. So by shutting off the fuel, it's a much safer engine. So to shut off the fuel would be a problem because if we pull this pop it out and we decrease the air metering force A and B down to zero, well, you should have remembered that there is a spring right here that's going to hold open the poppet right there and provide idle fuel. So with the idle cutoff as far back as it will go, or I should say with this bleed open as wide as it can, then we would be left with idle fuel because of the spring. So something else has to happen. And something else does happen. When this is pulled all the way back, this ramp right here causes this arm to go down. So this ramp right here makes contact with that, causing this arm to go down. Well, there's a pivot right there. So when that arm goes down, this is going to go up. And this is not a hinge point. It is just the way it's designed. The hinge point is actually up here for this entire system. And so what happens as this plunger then is pushed up, it pushes this piece that way pulling the poppet all the way back, seating the needle right there, cutting off all fuel. So that's why it's called an idle cutoff cam, because this comes down, this goes up, pushes on this, that pushes it that way, and pulls all of this that way, shutting off all of the fuel. So that is how the mixture control and idle cutoff operate. Now let's talk about the idle and power enrichment valve system right here. That's what we wanna talk about right now. So if you remember, we're talking about the fact that during idle, the spring right here is gonna hold the poppet off its seat just enough to allow a certain amount of fuel to come up through the main metering jet into chamber C and it's gonna roll right over here to the other side of the carburetor where we're talking about now. And we talked about the fact that um, the poppet valve being open and the main metering jet really aren't regulating fuel at idle. So we needed some way to regulate fuel at idle. Well, that's done with this little needle right in here. So what happens is fuel is going to come down this way, press on this diaphragm, forcing it to the left, which would open up a needle and seat right here. And at the same time, we have Venturi suction acting on the back of this diaphragm, also pulling it to the left. So between fuel pressure in C and Venturi air, which came from B, moving the diaphragm to the left, it will open up this needle and seat. However, it is being regulated by a manual uh, enrichment system right here. So this is connected this right here is connected directly to the throttle and will only allow the pop or so the um the this valve right here to open so far so that's the that's why it's called the manual idle control rod because it's manually restricting it so let's take a look over here at this picture we'll enlarge this right here so we can take a look at what's happening so this is in fact the same picture that we we're looking at 
right here, but just enlarged and unfortunately not in color. Sorry about that. All right, so we have this idle needle right here, enlarged to right here. And you can see what's happening is that during idle, very low idle, um, where you see idle to 25% power, it's going to run in this area right here. So this is going to do the metering. And so if this part right here is with the seat, so we have the seat, um, probably a bad example of a seat, then we're only going to get a little bit of fuel to come through this way. And that is doing the metering because this area right here is in fact smaller than the main metering jet. So this does the metering at idle. And then as the pilot advances the throttle and you want a little bit more idle fuel, well, then you're going to be in this area of the needle, which will increase the size opening and allow a little bit more fuel to go through. And as the throttle is advanced even further, well, then it's going to come into the 65% power, and then we get into 100% power. The needle is going to be all the way out of the seat right here, allowing all of the fuel to come through that is being metered by the main metering jet. And once again, it's the manual system because this right rod right here is linked directly to the throttle valve and it limits how far back the diaphragm will go, allowing this, how far that will be open. So that is the, the manual system. Well, some aircraft have this combination uh, idle and power enrichment valve all operated manually. Other carburetors have the option of having the um, airflow power enrichment valve system, which is going to be somewhat different than what we're looking at right here. So the first thing that's going to be different is we have an airflow power enrichment valve that is actually going to sit, if you can notice, I'm going to bring it right over here and kind of superimpose that on top of that right there. And so what we have on this particular system here is that get my laser pointer here. This is still the same metering jet we were looking at before, but we have added this needle right here in this entire assembly right there to what was not there before. So we have unmetered fuel is going to come up in through here and fill this chamber while we have venturi suction on the back side of this. Uh, and a needle, uh, sorry, spring, and a spring. So the spring is going to force the needle that way, and it is going to keep this in the closed position. So under normal operating parameters, uh, this will be closed until such time as fuel pressure in here plus venturi suction in here overcome the spring and move this needle off its seat. And of course, when do you think that would happen? And the answer should be at very high power settings. When the vacuum is at the highest, air flowing through here is going to be at a maximum across the venturi, creating the maximum amount of suction in here. Plus, we have the maximum amount of pressure in D going up through here creating a maximum amount of pressure right there, plus a maximum amount of venturi suction would open this up. And that would happen at high power settings. And I would say above 65% power because cruise is 65% power. Now, at the same time, we have added something here. We're going to have this over here is going to be different. And I'll leave this back over here because I think it's a little easier to see and I'll make it a little bit larger so we can take a look at it. So what is different now is we have a completely different idle uh, step valve right here. So before in the manual system, we had 25% power, plus we had a, a section that was 65% power. So we had we have this is the 25, then before we had another portion of the needle where it was 65% power, but that is completely gone. So in the Old, in the manual system, I don't want to say old system, in the manual system, what happens is as this needle right here is pulled out, we have idle one, we have an idle two area, and then the rest of it is wide open, and the fuel is being metered over here between the main metering jet and this. So 
at cruise settings, we'll get fuel through here, down, around, across the needle. But at higher power settings, we will get fuel also through here, mixing with here. So we have the two fuels coming through, two fuels coming through, so have more fuel coming through. Now, as opposed to uh, the manual system, where we only had one waiter fuel to get through. So we have more fuel coming through here. And I imagine that this right here would be a bigger opening, allowing more fuel at all times to come through. Well, it would have to be bigger because this would have to supply enough fuel at max power. So we have max power fuel coming through here in the manual system, coming through here and entering here. But instead of having a needle that is wide open in this area, we have a needle that is still limiting it at that 65% power range. So that's the two systems. We have the manual system and the um, air system here, the airflow system. All right, once the fuel leaves the idle needle valve right here, it is going to go through this passage up this way and off in to the discharge nozzle needle valve. Now, the way this operates, as you can see on one side of the diaphragm, we have metered fuel pressure that came from, again, the needle over here. And on the other side of the diaphragm, we have the dark gray, which indicates venturi suction. And we can see that coming up right through here, off into here. So on this side over here, we have venturi suction, that is going to pull the diaphragm this way. We have fuel pressure, which is going to move the diaphragm that way, but we have a spring right here, which is going to force the diaphragm the opposite way. And we also have a little tiny spring right here. So what is going to happen is with the springs in the relaxed position, it is going to force this needle over this way and close it off right there. So we have absolutely no fuel flow going into the discharge nozzle. And then as we get fuel pressure coming up this way, it is going to act upon the diaphragm and start opening it up. And the more venturi suction we get from air flowing through the venturi will create more venturi suction. And so when the fuel pressure on this side and the venturi suction on this side are uh, sufficient to exceed the spring pressure here, it will start to open this valve right here. And as it opens that valve, fuel will come in through this way and off into the discharge nozzle, also mixing with impact air to help emulsify that fuel, break it down into little droplets. So we have air pressure and fuel pressure, and we have our discharge nozzle operating there. Then when we close the throttle valve and we uh, pull back the mixture with this plunger comes up, pulls back the spring, closes the poppet valve right here, we're gonna lose fuel pressure lose uh, venturi suction, and when a loss of fuel pressure and a loss of venturi suction, it is gonna allow that to move forward, cutting off fuel right here, which then makes a nice, even, clean cutoff. So that's what's happening right there. Now let's talk about this accelerator pump down here. So what's happening here is that when the throttle valve is actually closed, this area up here is under a tremendous amount of vacuum because of the pistons pulling back and their need for air is being restricted by the throttle valve. So even though this color up here is pink and this down here is showing venturi suction, what we really have is, an, is suction through this entire area right here. Well, honestly, if we want to think about it, it's really more suction in this area right here than anything. Um, down here, we're not getting much air flow, so there's really not a lot of suction down here, but we certainly have suction up top. And so that suction that is up here is going to translate through into here and into here. And so this is now going to be under a lot of suction. And that is going to pull this diaphragm back against the spring pressure. And when it does that, the fuel that is allowed to come up into this way is going to enter this chamber and right there is a little tiny passageway so the fuel is going to come up through here 
into this passageway and fill this up. Meanwhile, there is a little tiny spring and check valve right there, a one-way check valve. And so fuel is gonna come in here and actually press against that. And with spring pressure, it's gonna keep this little valve closed. All right, so we have a lot of suction has pulled this back, filling this chamber up with fuel, and it's just gonna sit there. And as long as we're in idle, nothing is gonna happen. But when this throttle valve is opened rapidly, then the area right here that was under a tremendous amount of suction because of the pistons pulling back, well, now we've relieved the blockage by opening the throttle valve. This area right here is now going to become pink like it is now. It's going to become much, much closer to ambient pressures. So if we were down on the ground, it would be about an inch less. So on the ground, we'd have 29.92 because we still have a restriction right here. Wide open throttle. The pressure in here is going to drop about one inch. So it'd be 28.92 inches is what we'd be looking at for pressure here, which is not a vacuum really um, as compared to what it was. So we've lost our vacuum going into here, lost the vacuum, which means the spring can now actually start to push this way in addition to the pressure that's been developed. So that is gonna force the fuel that was in here to go somewhere. Well, a little tiny bit can go through that opening, but that is really small. Most of it is gonna come through this passage right there. It is going to push against this plate and this spring right here, which are, it's a lightweight spring. This pressure is greater than the fuel pressure here, so it's gonna open up this, and all that fuel that was packed into here is now gonna be forced up this way, which is on the other side of this restriction or this restriction. So that is going to allow all of this pressure, unrestricted access up through here, out and out the discharge nozzle. So we had a sudden influx of fuel that made it uh, through the discharge nozzle, giving us a momentary rich mixture because we opened the throttle valve suddenly. Now, as soon as this fuel that was in here is exhausted, well, then no more fuel is gonna go this way and it's gonna to return to being, uh, the carburetor return to being metered by the metering jet and if we're um, in the 65% step area, that too. So otherwise, that's how we get a mixture, a, a very sudden and quick mixture to go out the discharge nozzle when the throttle was rapidly opened. One option that some of these carburetors have is an automatic mixture control assembly. And we've got one over here. And so the way this works is, we'll go with this right here, is that we have chamber A, A pressure and chamber B pressure are vented to this. So we'll use this right here. Just have to forgive the sloppiness over here. But we have chamber A impact air is coming into this right here. So we have chamber A right there. And chamber B, oh, we just use dark blue. Chamber B is then vented over, not through there, into here. So we have suction into here. And so what happens as we go up in altitude with this is this is a sealed bellows unit up here. And as we go up into altitude and the air pressure becomes less, this bellows right here will expand and get bigger. And as we go down in altitude and the pressure increases, then it will contract this bellows right here. Much like if you had a bag of potato chips and you buy them down in the valley and you go up in altitude, you'll notice that bag of potato chips, if you haven't opened it, which uh, I have never bought a bag of potato chips and not opened them immediately, so I've only uh, going by hearsay here. You go up in altitude, then the bag would expand because of the lower air pressure at altitude. And so it works the same way here. So down on the ground, we can see that the needle right here is seated. And so this um, suction right here has no way to get through the needle. It would be contracted and this little area right here would be sealed off because it is an inverted needle. It is tapered that way. And so as we go up in altitude and this expands right here, it is going to push down this way until it gets to the smaller section of the needle 
then is in this spot right here, which then creates an air bleed. So we have a vacuum here and a pressure here. And so then what happens is because we have that uh, pressure differential, then the air pressure here is going to come through there and off into here, which will in effect create a, um, a drop in air pressure here. So that creates a lowering of our air metering force because some of the air pressure in A is now allowed to bleed through into B. So there'll be less pressure in A and less suction in B. It's working in the exact same principle this worked in. Uh, in fact, you would still have both of these items. You'd still have this and this on an aircraft carburetor equipped with the automatic mixture control. Um, they work independently of and somewhat in parallel with each other. So the automatic mixture control would be working and doing its thing all on its own. And if the pilot wanted to lean out the mixture a little bit more, well, the pilot still has control of this right here. So that is the automatic mixture control. Now, one thing you can consider, it's a great question, what happens if the automatic mixture control bellows gets a hole in it? Well, if it gets a hole in it, then it wouldn't work anymore, right? You get a hole in your bag of potato chips, or if you're like me and you open up your bag of potato chips, well, then the bag doesn't expand. So if the automatic mixture control no longer works, what happens to the aircraft as it goes up in altitude? Well, that's the same thing as saying, what happens to the aircraft as it goes up in altitude if it doesn't have an automatic mixture control? Well, the carburetor runs richer. That's all. Just runs richer. Well, how is it compensated? Well, the pilot just has to use this, which pilot was probably going to use anyway. So it's not a big deal. It's just that the automatic mixture control is a helpful tool for the pilot to automatically lean out the carburetor as you go up in altitude. But for any carburetor not equipped with it, and many aren't, then you're just gonna use the manual mixture control in entirety. For this last segment, what I wanna talk about is adjustments to the carburetor. Now, as you can see right here, I do have a cutaway carburetor for PS5 Bravo Delta version. And there are a lot of things on here that one could adjust if you so desired to do it. And I strongly suggest you don't. Um, but we, looking around, we have the uh, air power enrichment valve. Um, we have the discharge nozzle valve. And we have, um, what else do we have over here? Um, we do have the screen, which is acceptable to take out this screen right here and clean that. In fact, you should take it out and clean it. I would say every 100 hours or every annual inspection. Just a little tiny screen. If that gets plugged up, why we're not going to get any fuel to the carburetor. Um, but uh, looking around, a few other things you might be interested in. Here is our automatic mixture control with the bellows right there. And if we pull that up, we have the little needle down inside there. All right, but getting back to adjustments. Here are the adjustments that you could make. Now, as any good aircraft mechanic, the first thing you should verify before even adjusting anything is do you in fact get full travels of the controls in the cockpit. So by that, I mean, you should have some cushion. When you advance the throttle all the way to wide open and the mixture all the way to wide open, the stops should hit out in the carburetor before it hits in the cockpit. So we push the throttle all the way wide open and we should see this stop right here, contact that, that is wide open and still have some space in the cockpit right? Ensuring that you're wide open throttle there. And of course, you can see the butterfly down in there is wide open. And right there is the idle position. And on the other side, we have the mixture. And so when we go all the way full rich, we should contact the stop here before it contacts in the cockpit. And we should make sure that as we pull it all the way back, that it goes all the way into the full lean off position right there. And of course, if you remember, there's the little ramp right there that went on this cam and this cam moved in here and pushed the plunger, removing the spring from the idle position. So, all right, so we're gonna make sure that we have all the proper travels and moving back over to here, what can we adjust? All right, so right here is the idle position and we can tell because the throttle valve is all the way closed. There is a screw right here that you may adjust 
for idle speed. And that is the one of the only two screws that you should touch is idle speed, that is okay. So we would adjust idle speed to about 600 RPM. So this data that I'm talking about is coming right from the uh, Bendix PS5 or Bendix PS series carburetor manual dated back in April 1976. So they say go ahead and set that to about 600 RPM. Now the next thing we wanna set is the idle mixture. And the idle mixture is actually set right here with this screw. And what that's doing is that screw is changing this little plunger and it's changing and it's a spring loaded. So let me see if I can get in there and make that move. So that is spring loaded right there. So that is changing where this item touches this right there. And this shaft is what that is doing. So I have it right there. If I were to screw this in, then it would move this shaft, this move it out a little bit. And then if I decrease that, it allows the shaft to go back in a little bit. Well, this shaft, if you remember, and if we go over to our other drawing right here, that shaft is this shaft right here. Here. Hopefully we can see that. Let me get the laser pointer going. It is this shaft right there that we're adjusting, which limits how far that needle is allowed to come out of its seat. So if we have it so that the needle is further in its seat, then we are going to get less fuel. And if we move it back out, we will get more fuel. So that is how we're going to set our idle speed or sorry, our idle mixture with this screw right here. And according to the Bendix manual on this particular carburetor, the proper idle mixture is when the idle um, cutoff, we put into idle cutoff, the carburetor should have about a 10 degree rise in RPM before shutting off, indicating that we are about 10 RPM to the rich side of best power. So that would allow us to set that. So again, this is the idle mixture right here, which we can adjust. And this over here is the idle speed, which we can adjust, but we should not adjust this one because to get into adjusting where the enrichment, the power enrichment comes in and everything else, that requires some special tools and manuals. It gets a little bit more complicated than I would like to get into in this video, especially considering the need for special tools. So those are the only two things we can adjust. So that right there is the PS5 Bendix pressure carburetor.